episode? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I'm Natalie Abrams, a senior writer at Entertainment Weekly, and tonight we are chatting with the cast of Man in the High Castle. It's uh, Amazon's high concept drama that tells the story of what would have happened if the Axis powers had won World War II. So let's bring out the cast. Alexa Davalos. <laughs> Luke Kleintank. and Karsten Norgard. Well, first off, since we're here for SAG, uh, how did each of you get your SAG card? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I don't remember it, sadly, um, which means I've been doing this for um, a little while. Um, I believe it started uh, with a hair commercial, to be honest, when I was about 12. I think that's, I think that's how it happened. <laughs> Uh, mine was uh, in New York City. I did Law and Order SVU, so they tapped heart lead me into uh, the union. Uh, yeah, that was it. I mean, that, that's kind of like the New York. You know, you, you have to do a Law and Order to, <laughs> to 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 get your SAG card, and so that's what I did. That was mine. Um, I got. I, I think it was Taft Hartley as well, but uh, Disney Law and Order. No, <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, Mighty Ducks, and, and, but they ended up paying for it in the end. So that was nice. He was the villain in Mighty Ducks, too, just in case you didn't recognize him. <laughs> yeah. Changes everything. <laughs> so what initially attracted each of you to Man in the High Castle? Oh, gosh, uh, it's a laundry list of things, um, beginning with, obviously, the, the subject matter and the character and, um, and Philip K. Dick, um, kind of a culmination of all those things, um, but mainly Juli Juliana Crane, absolutely. Yeah, I think mine is the same. I mean, Philip K. Dick and just the kind of the premise of the story, that what if um, taking a, a real-life aspect and kind of flipping it on his head. And then, you know, working with Ridley Scott's not too bad. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, all the ducks kind of lined up, and I'm very blessed. Uh, exactly. Uh, all the same things. Um, I'm a huge Philip K. Dick fan, and um, like you said, what if our world wasn't what it was supposed to be today? I mean, if you don't have the freedoms that we're used to, um, I think everybody at a certain stage in their life think about what if, and um, I certainly have, so. It's also interesting, too, because it's, it's very timely. You know, I think, uh, I think um, you know, in the reality we live in today, it's so easy to kind of accept the world you live in, and it's kind of nice to see something else, and uh, it, it makes you ask questions. It makes you question your own reality, and I hope that's what it does for people. You know, I think uh, you can kind of separate yourself and realize that this is something that could have been. And um, what does that mean for, for, for the reality you live in today? You know, it, it, just, it, it just makes you ask a lot of questions about life and the world you live in. Mm -hmm. you know? And what was your audition process like for Man in the High Castle, especially maybe compared to some of the projects you've done before? Uh, I, I, I'm an extreme Luddite. Um, I, on all levels, um, but this job kind of changed that for me just a smidge because I auditioned with an iPhone, <laughs> and nice. suddenly I felt like, okay, wait a minute, I have to give this technology thing a little more credit, um, and uh, that's that's I, I yeah I was in England and I, I auditioned with my phone and a friend in a weird room in Bristol, and um, sent it off and and then uh, was in LA a few weeks later reading with this one. And then I was on a plane four days later to shoot the pilot. My, you know, I think I, I think I had the hardest audition process. To be honest, I went I went to I went to the casting director. Then I went into the producers. Then I went into the director. Then I went back to the producers. And then they said that my hair was too short. <laughs> and then you know, and then uh, and then I had a meeting with Amazon. And by the end of it, I thought, oh sh you know, shit, I'm, that's it. I'm not, I, I didn't get the role. And uh, they called. And my buddy was with me at the time, and um, they called when I when I went down to to the car, and I love him so so much. But he had bought in a bottle of champagne because he he 
he predicted that I had gotten the role. And when they called and gave me, gave me the okay, uh, he's like, hey, man, I got this bottle of champagne. Let's celebrate. And I was like, ah, let's do it. And uh, it was great. It was great. Mine was really very un uneventful. I uh, went in once, and uh, that was it. Tape for it. <laughs> Must be nice. Voila. Must be nice. Did you know anything about your character? Like, how much did they tell you, and how much research did you do? Did you actually read the book at all? Yes, I, I had read the book uh, many, many moons ago. A friend of mine was obsessed with it uh, years ago, and I, I read it then. And uh, when it came back around in script form, I kind of thought, is this possible that they're actually going to do this? This is amazing. <laughs> Yes, I can. <laughs> Forgive me. This is the story of my life, by the way. Can you speak into Always. the microphone? Yes, I can. Um, uh, yes. Uh, you know, I, seeing it in script form, suddenly I, I felt like I, I kind of couldn't believe my eyes. It's such a, it's such a you know, it's a world to dive into. Um, and um, I read the book. I read it again. I've now read it too many times. Um, and uh, I really, I really love, I love, I love this book. Um, and it is obviously the root of our tree. And so I, I am, um, yeah, I go back to it a lot. I hadn't, I hadn't read the book. Um, and when I got the role, Frank Spotnitz, our creator, uh, who here has read the book? Is there a lot of people who read the book? So a few people. Um, well, if you haven't read the book, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you all have. My, my character doesn't have the greatest ending in the book. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be going to season two. My character gets, uh, gets nixed in the book, so by this one, by the way. Um, Spoiler alert. But no, hey, 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 listen. In, in I, the I, book, I, not I, in I the show. I need, I need a job, so hopefully the writers don't do that. Uh, so they, they encouraged me not to read the book just because they didn't want me to, um, you know, to have an anxiety attack about it. So uh, I didn't read the book until after we filmed the pilot and then I read the book and they told me, hey, listen, we're adapting the character and we're, we're ensuring you that uh, you're not going to have that, that ending. But it's, we, he, they've adapted the character very much, so. Um, Wagner uh, was obviously one of the central characters as well in, 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 uh, in the book, um, slightly different in the serialization we have done, but I guess that's that's the part that um, it's the challenging thing when you adopt a, a novel into a, a either a TV series or, yeah. or, a, or a film uh, to um, make it dramatic and also at the same time honor a great piece of, of literature. Um, I loved the book. I really thought it was extraordinary and such an amazing thing that everything f sort of takes place in people's heads. Mm -hmm. So I was very curious how would it, how would Frank actually um, get it out there? How do you guys think that Am the streaming out, uh, outlets like Amazon and Netflix, uh, Netflix and Hulu are sort of changing the game for writers and actors and the way in which stories can be told? I think it's changing things at a rapid speed. It's mind-blowing, actually, I think, how much opportunity it's afforded so many of us. I think, you know, there's so many more jobs. There's so much more content. There's an inordinate amount of content. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's completely changed everything. People are, are no longer tuning in once a week. You know, this is now, I feel like, sort of the modern-day novel. People are reading as many chapters as they want, all of them, if they can feel like it. Um, it's, it's absolutely changed everything. Do you feel more freedom at Amazon? Yeah, I mean, how many people here are actors? Oh, uh, uh, wow. Um, what I love in the industry is I, I love independent films just because there are no boundaries and it's, you know, there's so much more to do. And I think uh, Amazon kind of believes that. And so that's, this was kind of like an independent film, like a 10 hour independent film rather than a big studio picture with golems and you know, you know all that craziness. So um, yeah, it, it's rooted in the characters, it's rooted in the story, it's rooted in the world. So um, Amazon encourages that. And I think uh, Netflix and you know, most of these, um, these kind of online medias, they, they tend to do that. I mean, they, th that's why you think Breaking Bad, Bloodline, all these great series 
they are what they are because you know they, they're able to push the boundaries and I think that's um, something that network TV tends not to do because uh, they've and they've got stuck in this kind of, you know, this formulaic uh, mentality. So uh, Amazon, is, it, it pushes the boundaries and it encourages it, which is uh, a blessing as an actor, as an artist, you know, because that's what we want to do. I'm sure that's what everyone in here wants to do. They want to they wanna create something beautiful, something, uh, something meaningful. And I think, uh, I think that's what this does. The level of cooperation, uh, collaboration on, on this project that was, was quite unique, I think. Everybody seemed to be proud custodians of their own world, both in front and behind. And um, I guess it was because of the material, but maybe also because of Amazon's inclusiveness when they started out. Everybody was voting on, on the <coughs> pilot and, and uh, it sort of carried on. And, and um, I think with the success of, of these outlets, Hulu, Netflix and, and, and Amazon, I, I think it's it's a fertile ground for actors. It reminds me a little bit about the golden era of Danish film uh, when they started Dogma. Um, and suddenly everybody started doing it. The next thing is going to be that Ralph's going to have their own channel. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys all have film in your background. What would you say are some of the challenges and, and also appeals of TV versus film and vice versa? You know, I, for me, it's the character. The character comes first. Whether it's a film or a television show, it doesn't doesn't really phase me too much. Obviously, the filming process is very different, as you all know. Um, you know, on a film, you spend three months in a character, and and in in this situation, this could be, you know, if we're lucky enough to go again, this could be an ongoing thing. So there's a sort of there's a marriage element to doing television that I I find to be one of the massive differences for me is the sort of commitment level and. Um, and building an arc that will stretch long enough, um, you know. Uh, but but ultimately, the the process is the same. I find. Yeah, you know, I, I've done shows like uh, Pretty Little Liars. You ever heard of that show? <laughs> so that that show, I mean, not not to say it's a terrible show, but it's um, it's not something that uh, I truly enjoy and. Uh, <laughs> But this um, this this show is is like a film. So um, being able to dive into the characters and it picks up where it left off each episode. So you get to track the character. So it is like a film, and that's what's beautiful about this this kind of uh, uh, media. But yeah, it's much different. It's much different. If you if you're doing it, it's very similar doing cable TV, you know, AMC, HBO, those kind of things. Um, but yeah, if you're doing network TV like ABC, CW, you know all those kind of networks, they they just uh, it's a formula. So um, yeah, I guess it's a, I guess it's a little different, in my opinion. I think when you think about movies, the, it's either like a two two hundred million dollar movies or no budget movies. It seems like everything in the middle mm -hmm. have sort of fallen out. So. As an actor, I think working on something like The High Castle, where you can really um, get to strut your stuff and, and, and dig into it, uh, I think that's that's uh, that's the new world. I think that's yeah. Now, the obviously the subject matter is very controversial in Man in the High Castle. Did any of you have any hesitation before taking on these roles? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 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 I play a Nazi, so yeah. I mean, how many have any? Has everybody seen the the, the entire series? You've seen the entire series. All oh, you're gonna watch the entire series now? Okay, good. Um, I, I, you know, yeah. I guess from the beginning, but um, throughout the series, there were there were many hesitations of things that my character has to do. Um, that really, uh, you know, made me question what I'm doing as a person, you know, because you know, what, what's the saying? Uh, what is it? Uh, life imitates art. I, art imitates life. You know, it, it's uh, it's hard to kind of separate yourself as an individual from the work, and so it really weighs on your soul. And um, that was that was I struggled with that a lot. And uh, it's beautiful, but it's also really damn hard. So yeah. Carson, what about yeah. you? 
Um, I didn't have any hesitation of, of when I booked the job. Um, I think the subject matter is a very um, thought-provoking um, uh, journey, and, and I think it touched so many lives. So many people gave the freedom to the freedom we have today, and, and uh, even though it's an alternative reality, you kind of want to make it as real as possible, and part of that reality is that you show this paraphernalia, you show all these things, and, and um, I, I was in, 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 in Europe for, for part of the shoot, and, and uh, I remember being co you know, covered when I, when I left my trailer until right on set. Um, yeah. It's interesting. A lot of it, too, was shot on green screen, uh, and they added in sort of the Nazi imagery. What does shooting on green screen, how does that sort of change your choices that you're making? Is it a little bit more difficult? Did you do a lot of, you did, did you do a lot of green screen? I didn't, I didn't do very much at all on this. No, I've done I mean, I mean, the, the, plenty on other things. The sets that they created were incredible, unbelievable. I mean, you'd walk onto set and it would just be that world. Uh, I think the only thing that I did was green, green screen was um, in the pilot. Uh, th there's there's that scene where you see New York City for the first time and it's you know all the swastikas and it's kind of a it's a new world I was in the middle of a parking lot walking in a parking lot and there was nothing around me um, yeah that was kind of bizarre and hard I just see I don't know how he, what's his name Daniel Radcliffe from Harry Potter does it I mean he, you know they have like a like a tennis ball and he's like this is a dragon <laughs> How, yeah, do you, how do you do that? You know what it is? That's it's been, really hard. It goes back to being a kid. When you're a little yeah. kid and you imagine something and you believe it with everything in your body. If you believe that someone's chasing you and you're running down the street. As a little kid, I used to do that all the time. And it's that. It's that. There's something actually I've found having done a lot of green screen yeah. stuff um, that, uh, you know, you just go into that, that space of being a kid and it's, it's make-believe and it's it kind of in its purest form, which there's something kind of, kind of beautiful about it, actually. The arrival of uh, when I arrived in, in San Francisco in, in, uh, in the first episode, um, the whole plane, that was obviously yeah. CG, you know, like, and, and uh, it looks amazing afterwards. I mean, they really did a good job on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a question from the audience, uh, from Bill Cates. Uh, is the sense I have of metaphors for modern life and the current political climate present in the show coincidental or on purpose? Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's coincidental, but I, th there's a great saying that um, where does it go? Um, misunderstanding of the present grows fatally from the ignorance of the past. So I, I think that rings true in this show. Um, history tends to repeat itself, and this is an anti-fascist story, and this is an anti-fascist novel. So. Um, like I said, you know, it's nice to kind of step back and question your own reality. Uh, it's too easy to get comfortable in your own reality, and this kind of lets you look at something different. And hopefully, that's what it does for the people. You know, um, it's a it, it the, the story is about humanity. You know, that's that that's that's the basis of it, and all these characters and their integrity and who they are, and and uh, the world they live in, and what they struggle with, and um, uh, what they're willing to do and what they're willing not to do. I think that's I think that's you know true in everyone in this audience. You know I think that's what we all should question ourselves in the world we live in because we're a society as people. And uh, yeah, Carson. I guess we all like influenced by our society and and where we where we live and and um, um, I think that. Denmark was occupied during the war, so um, I remember growing up, we talked a lot about, or the elder talked about how, how it was, and, and it's interesting for this to come out, and I meet people who they say, oh my God, we didn't win. What if we didn't win? You know, I mean, like the whole, what if? I mean, could we have lost? I mean, and where, what would it, what would, what, how would our life be? And then, I mean, then some of the rhetoric that's uh, being uh, put out there today, I mean, yeah. it has a similar sound. Donald Trump reminds me of Hitler, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> 
Uh, so for all the audience here, uh, since they are actors, is there one piece of advice you would give them? Run. Run. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm a third generation actor. I, can't, I, I, I grew up in a family of circus people. So I, um, you know, as far as advice goes, I'm, my granddad has been my saving grace always. Um, and he just, his always, always, always same thing. Follow your heart, kid. You follow that heart. I don't care where it takes you. You follow your heart. And that's, you know, I think that's the truth. I think as, as artists, I think we, we love and live and breathe this world. It's hard. It's really hard to be in this, in this business. And, and um, you know, but I think at the end of the day, if you don't want to do anything else and you know that there's nothing else for you, then that's why we're here, you know? I'm still trying to figure it out myself. <laughs> um, I think uh, for me, I think the main thing is, yeah, be true to yourself. Um, keep the loved ones around you that keep you grounded in life because this town t tends, to, uh, tends to take you somewhere else and it tends to uh, bring out your insecurities and your, your, the demons inside. Um, and I think the main thing is not being afraid to lose. You know, if, if you're not afraid to lose and you accept losing, then you appreciate winning so much more. And so um, if you can live by that motto, which is really hard to do, uh, I, I guarantee you, you'll succeed. I think having a good support system is, uh, is a key. Um, aside from that, Mark Twain once said, beware of people who belittle your ambitions. Lots of people will tell you that you will fail, but the truly great will make you feel that you too can be truly great. And um, I think that's, I've been blessed to have a, people around who made me feel like that. My, my father always told me growing up, he said, it's, uh, it's not the suit that makes the man, it's the man that makes the suit. So stay true to that. There are a lot of actors who say they don't go back and watch their work. Uh, do all of you go back and watch? And is there, and if you do, is there anything? <laughs> he knows me, clearly. Uh, if you do, is there anything that um, bugs you when you're watching it? Everything. Yeah, everything. <laughs> every, 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 everything. It's like hearing your voice on an answering machine, but like, it's like, it's just death. It's just terrible. It's terrible. I don't, I can't. Um, I, 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 in the process, I'll, I'll, I'm sort of okay to see bits and pieces, and, and we learn. We learn from seeing, you know, bits and pieces. There's things I think, God, why didn't anyone tell me I did that? It'd be really good if someone told me that. Um, but no, it's painful. I, I can't. <laughs> I can't do it. No. I try. I try not to. Uh, but I have a I have a really big family, and they force me to. <laughs> so I, I I also think it's good because you can kind of you know see what you're doing, and um, you know when you're being honest. I, you know, as it, I, I know when I'm being honest, and if uh, if you're phoning it in. And I think you can see that with actors, and you can just, you know, you just know it's kind of like an innate thing. So, if if I watch myself and I go, hey, Luke, you you weren't there that day. You you, you got to work harder. So um, it just it, it it encourages me to to work harder and to to do more. And you guys saw episode six, right? That was episode six. Um, there's a lot more I could have done in that. And that to be honest, and. Um, I didn't do it, and, I, and I'm happy with I'm happy with it. But uh, there's always more you can do. There's always more you can uh, go inside yourself or go inside the character and just you know just be more of an artist. And I and I think that's um, something I I gotta I just gotta keep doing. You know. I agree. Um, I think that seeing footage can be a great motivator. I remember on this when Dan showed us uh, sort of an early cut of, of two mm -hmm. and uh, I think everybody came away, whoa, it's continuing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just never good enough, is it? I mean, when you watch yourself, it's never, ever, ever going to be good enough. You have to watch yourself, though. Good, though. You, know, you, you have to watch yourself because you go do ADR and you're forced to watch yourself. So. <laughs> I love it when Johnny Depp says, oh, you know, I never, uh, I never watch myself in the films that I do. I'm like, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because you have to go to ADR. I know you do. 
<laughs> Alexa, you've actually done back-to-back -back period pieces between Mob City and Man in the High Castle. What challenges come with doing projects like those versus modern storytelling, whether it's costumes, acting choices, slower cadence, any of that? Uh, I, I don't get to do the contemporary stuff as much as I would like. I'd love to just throw on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and, you know, but uh, yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I love to time travel, I have to say. I do feel like I was born in the wrong era. And so to be able to, to live as many different lives as possible, as many different women, to be as many different women as I possibly can um, in a period that I didn't get to live and exist in and, and explore um, is a huge gift. And I, I just aesthetically, just looking at the, the visual aspects of the cars and the clothes and everything you come in contact with, um, I have a real connection to things from the past, so I think that probably it's my fault. The period pieces, I think it's my fault. What era would you live in? I'm interested to that. Oh, 30s. 30s. Paris. Paris. Definitely. I can see you there. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. And he speaks French fluently, by the way. It's true. It's true. Amazing. Um, Luke, Joe is definitely not a uh, black and white character, even down to the final scenes with him and Juliana in the finale, no spoilers. Um, did you know from the beginning that there was this ambiguity to him, or was there a point where you sort of had to switch gears? Uh, well, me and Frank Spotness talked about it, I mean, and he kind of said that, um, you know, all these characters are not black and white, they're interesting shades of gray, and you know. Uh, so he, he, he gave me a heads up. I, don't, I, I still don't know how to feel about the guy, you know, and I, it's kind of, uh, it's interesting because for me as an individual, I'm 25 years old and um, yeah, I'm young, I'm a young guy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out my life in this world. So we kind of met at a, at a, kind of a poignant time. So we, we, we relate very much so. And um, if that makes any sense. Uh, yeah, you so, and the character. Yeah, me, yeah. Me, me, me and Joe. You and Joe. Me yeah. and Joe. Uh, so yeah, I, I knew, I knew, but I didn't know where, where they were going with it because we get the scripts, you know, what, eight, eight days before. So it's, uh, it's been a ride. Yeah, and Kirsten, you play a pretty prominent role in the final few episodes, especially um, without giving away too much. What can you say about uh, taking on that role and that subject matter? It's, it seemed... Pretty tough, I would imagine. Um, I think it's a deeply flawed character, character and, and um, it's a character that's on a road to redemption and, and had turned a corner as opposed to uh, John Smith, uh, who was kind of in denial of what they had done. and, and um, uh, It was interesting to to put a heart into the character and, and like it's, it's difficult to admission. <laughs> <laughs> hard. Um but uh, it, it was a very challenging character and I, I definitely loved it. It's like everybody catching up it. to the swashka with the heart. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, now, given what we see in the in the finale, do you guys have any theories on what's going on? Do you guys sit around and talk about that? Or did you call each other when you got that script to try to dissect what happens? We, um, <laughs> we, we, do, we do pontificate on what might uh, happen. I think, um, you know, in the process of making the first series, we were, we were extremely involved um, on a level that I, I have not been prior um, to, to this project. And um, so there was endless, endless conversations and dialogue and how do we and what do we and how, you know, constant, constant, constant. Um, so now I think we just, we, we don't know if we're going again. So that's, that's kind of what we're deliberating <laughs> at the moment. Um, I don't think there's any way to, to really tell. I know that Frank is, um, you know, an expert at serialized television, and he knows how to stretch things um, as much as possible. And so, really, we've just only scratched the surface, and, and we're nowhere near the end of the novel even. So, um, it's a long way to go if we get the opportunity. 
And any word on second season? Uh, it's very promising. <laughs> That's I, what we keep I can hearing. say that. I mean, I, I can tell you that the writers are, are writing uh, a lot of season two right now. So the official word hasn't come out, but um, I'm, we're, we're waiting for it. And I think it's, uh, I don't, I don't want to give a percentage because I can't, but no, um, don't I do won't. It. <laughs> but uh, I think it's, it, is, it is very promising. And uh, the fans seem to love it and the people seem to love it. And I love it. So I need a job, by the way. So maybe what did you, what did you say? Maybe. Maybe a Trump presidency will help make the show I would hope not. Pertinent. Uh, well, thank you all for coming out tonight, Man in the High Castle on Amazon right now. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.